uh, as I gave the intro pulpal, I didn't realize the sound was uh, being recorded. But as I gave myself an intro pulpal, as I was reviewing back the videos, all I could hear was myself grunting, going, oh, <laughs> because it was that painful. But I, had to keep my, I had to keep my mouth open while I'm numbing myself up through the pulp. But honestly, after that was done, it was like magic. I could, you know, I, I found all four canals, extirpated, done. Hello, Petrus Rati. I'm Jazz Galanti, and welcome back to another episode of the Petrusive Dental podcast. This month is Back to Basics. So it's episode number two of Back to Basics on a huge daily conundrum, which is getting success in local anesthesia. Like how many times in your career so far, uh, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but I'm pretty sure you might have had this where you've gone through a bad phase or a bad patch of your ID blocks just not working. Or how to manage that patient with a hot pulp, that lower molar with throbbing pain, and no matter how many infiltrations you give, you can't get the patient numb. Or how about the fact that most of the anesthesia we use is just usually lidocaine or articaine, and that's generally my experience, is there anything more to it? Now, to answer these questions, I've got George. Uh, his, his first name is far too complex from around, so we shall call him Dr. George, uh, who is a, a very well-known name in the UK. Uh, he actually does lots of advanced surgical dentistry, pterygoid implants, zygomatic implants, full arches, uh, that kind of stuff. He also does some general dentistry as well, but that's his real niche that he's known for. And along with that, he does teach on very advanced local anesthesia techniques, like how to give extra oral blocks, for example, or how to give uh, anesthesia in areas where you're not really taught at dental school but we're going to really bring it back to basics in this episode to go through how to get success from the more basic techniques like what are the the factors involved in getting success in anesthesia and right at the end we even cover the top tips in getting painless anesthesia for palatal those dreaded palatal injections now it's interesting when i was in um, vietnam on my elective um, i was with these dentists who are 25 years qualified uh, and they were celebrating like having a reunion and we we're on this charity project uh, in a village near Da Nang and it was a school. So we're at the school, we're about to do restorations, extractions, and basically any sort of dentistry these children needed. Uh, and there was a queue of children, and before they'd have their treatment, like for example, a restoration or a tooth out, we would numb them up. And I'll never forget how these children were given ID blocks, uh, so inferior alveolar nerve blocks, before they had their restorations on their lower teeth, for example, right? But the interesting thing that the, the leader of the group, he said that 50% of ID blocks fail. That's, that's what he said, 50% of ID blocks fail. So let's give these kids two ID blocks each before they have dental treatment, just in case they had this language barrier and they were actually having pain and they weren't just expressing themselves. So just to avoid that possibility of a child feeling pain, they gave two ID blocks. That always stuck with me. I know 50% is quite a, a strong uh, number and maybe it's, hopefully it's not very true. I'm hoping that our ID blocks are more successful than 50% of the time, but it's an international issue that we all face on a daily basis. So the protrusive dental pearl I have for this episode is a local anesthesia one. And it's very simple. If you wanna give painless anesthesia, give the topical anesthetic enough time. We know that already. But the other thing is that when you start giving your infiltration, for example, you want to first very slowly just give a few drops, just a few drops. And you wanna give these drops ever so slowly. And you wanna distract the patient. The way I do this uh, is by massaging the mucosa, massaging the lip with my between my finger and my thumb as I'm doing it. So they're really feeling this massaging rather than concentrating on the anesthetic. So you give very, very slowly, just a few drops and you come out. Give those few drops a minute to work. And then you can go back in and deliver your anesthetic much faster. Uh, and you can actually see the ballooning or swelling of the mucosa, which you usually do, that's fine. But it, the whole point is that if you can give the first few drops, pain-free, very slowly, after topical anesthetic. The patient now trusts you, has already had a painless experience. And then the second or the main dose of anesthetic, you can give much faster without hurting the patient. So I hope you enjoy this episode, Back to Basics, with George on local anesthesia techniques. I'll catch you in the outro. All right, uh, we're gonna call you Dr. George because as you said in the in the before part when we were offline, the people struggle. But just, just for the flavor, do tell us your full name, how your mother tongue was supposed to pronounce it. Uh, so it's Pinardus, uh, not Pinadeth, not uh, Prindadeth. I've heard all kinds, but it's Pinardus. Uh, and that's why everyone calls me George, because people forget how to uh, pronounce that. And it makes me cringe every time I hear it pronounced incorrectly. We, we will definitely stick to George. Uh, welcome to the Protrusive Dental Podcast, my friend. Uh, how are you? I'm good, thanks. I'm very good, thanks, Jazz. I've not seen you in some time. It's been a long time since I... 
um, I think we last saw each other and when I last saw Simran as well. So, of course, you, you, know, you used to teach my wife. Yes, yes, you used to teach my wife. She was an undergrad at Liverpool and she spoke very highly of you. So that's when you first came on radar. Gosh, maybe 10 years ago now. Uh, and I remember, I remember you are as a dentist back in the day when I was a student. I was going like on, online on dental and tubules and stuff and reading. The thing that struck me most about you was that you're a dentist who wasn't afraid to uh, speak your mind. Uh, and I, I, I like that. And it was, it was a, I wouldn't say controversial, but I, I enjoyed the fact that you were, you were calling a spade a spade. So um, I think this, this will make a very interesting episode, actually. I'm actually quite excited to, 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 to cover the topics we're going to cover today. Now, with you coming on, we could have spoken about so much because um, obviously I'll let you do a, a formal introduction about the kind of things you do. But in my eyes, like you're the pterygoid man. You know, anytime that, like, you know, anyone needs any fancy kind of implants, uh, no one else can, can sort it out. They're going to send it to you as the implant guy to, to, to have some sort of uh, fixed solution. So that's in my mind, that's who you are. But please tell us about the kind of things that you do, where you're based, so that those who, who do, haven't heard of you can learn more about you. I don't know where to start, actually, Jazz. I think most people, I think you're right. I think most people know me as a, a person who does implants. Uh, and sometimes people know me as a person who tends to just do complex implants. So uh, pterygoids, as you said, um, I ov obviously do zygomatics, um, transsinus, nasalis, as well as complex bone grafting. Um, so maybe not small grafts, some kind of more associated to more complex work. Or it may not even be the work, it may be a medically compromised patient. Um, I'll get referrals for that. But I, I'm not sure if people are aware that I also do restorative dentistry. So my background is restorative dentistry. Um, I still like doing uh, removable dentures, complete removable dentures. Um, I still like doing uh, implant over dentures. Um, I, I think there's a little bit of a bias to what you see on Facebook. Um, and people know mm -hmm. me for very set procedures. But actually, I, I do the, the full range. Um, I still do um, the odd fixed uh, conventional prosthetics, so fi fixed bridge work. Um, I still do the odd endo. Um, single uh, canal endo, that is. I, I don't touch multi-rooted. There, there are other people much better than me uh, doing that. Um, I teach uh, surgical endo. Um, what else? So I, I've got a bit of a range. I think the only thing I don't do is uh, ortho-grade multi-root canal uh, endo. I think that's the only thing I don't do. Uh, but otherwise, I, I, I do a fair range of oral surgery, implants, and restorative dentistry. Oh, I didn't appreciate that. I, I did think like a lot of people would think that you just limited it uh, to, to, to one aspect. But it's, it's great they do uh, a bit of everything. So it, it, I suppose it, it gives you a foundation that you've built on over the years. So what I want to know is what got you into the kind of advanced things that you do now? Who were your who were your mentors? Who were the people that inspired you to do the kind of crazy, complex surgical kind of stuff that you're into now? Oh, God. Um, uh, you know, I, I probably fell into it by accident. Um, I went, uh, I started doing implants pretty early on after VT, to be honest. Um, it was probably not a good idea to do that. Um, and then I ended up doing more of a formal course in Birmingham uh, with Tatum, Hilt Tatum. Um, and I went down that pathway. And on the course, it was very much Eastman um, lecturers on the course. So there was Ben Agabiegi, who was an Eastman oral surgery consultant. Um, but on that course, we also had someone called Richard Tucker, he was a periodontist, uh, and he headed up, I think at the time, he headed up the, the perio M. Dent at the Eastman. I don't think he's there anymore. Uh, and when I spoke to him about more perio surgery and more uh, refining restorative work, uh, he suggested I come down and do the MSc at uh, uh, restorative uh, dentistry, the MSc in restorative dentistry at the Eastman. So I went down that pathway because I looked up to these guys. But I, before that, I also spoke to Callum Youngson. I'm sure you know who Callum Youngson is. Um, he was still mm -hmm, dean mm -hmm. when um, Simran was a student in uh, Liverpool. Really charismatic chap. Like the way the story Sim would tell me about him, he just seemed like the coolest guy on earth. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I would echo that. He is an unbelievable man. He did a hell of a lot uh, for the university. I still look up to him. He was one of the big inspirations to me, as well as Ben, uh, as well as Hilt Tatum. Um, there are a few other guys who have also mentored me as well. Uh, there's a guy called VJ, um, who's also Meliali like me, who uh, originally started off Evo Dental. Um, so I started at Evo Dental, I think 2012, 13. Um, we started working together. Um, obviously, I was already doing implants at that point. Um, but there's been a number of people who have uh, inspired me. Um, 
also people who have inspired me from a distance. So not necessarily people who I've met, uh, but I uh, used to speak to the late Jamal Tanner, who was a uh, quite a well-known implant dentist uh, over in Romania. He's passed away due to COVID, um, quite sadly. Uh, but yeah, there's quite a few mm-hmm. people who have inspired me. But then um, also non-dentists and so my dad. Um, I always looked up to my dad. Uh, he was a was or is uh, a, an oncoplastic breast surgeon. Uh, so his background was general surgery, uh, then went into breast cancer, large reconstruction, uh, and then went. Uh, it kind of the, the the role changed, and his title became oncoplastic breast surgeon. But he showed me a lot, taught me a lot um, about suturing, surgical skills, assessment of patients. Um, yeah, so I think that's everyone really, isn't it? I mean, that, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, that makes a lot of sense to me, George, because I often think, how does one, without following a max fax pathway, get to raise these big flaps or, or, or get to, you know, how many dentists will get to see a pterygoid in their lifetime? Right. And then yet you're you're doing you're in those areas of anatomy all the time. So I was thinking, where was your surgical real um, inspiration? Sounds like your father being a surgeon himself was a, a big role in that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, it, not not just from a surgical point of view, but also from uh, the point of view, you know, I wasn't born in the UK. I was born in India. Um, I, I went back to India for schooling. I came back, I think, when I was 10. Um, and when we came over in the 80s, it was quite, it wasn't as, you know, as it was now. There weren't that many of us um, in uh, certain areas of the UK. Uh, my dad didn't know how to speak English, so he came over as a medical doctor, had to pass the PLAB um, while not knowing English, so he had to learn English at the same time. Um, I think he I think he failed the first PLAB exam, then uh, learned English a bit more fluently, then sat it the second time round. Um, passed the exam, and then he, he only came to the UK so he could uh, sit his FRCS, his fellow fellowship in the Royal College of Surgeons. Um, he did that, mm-hmm. um, and then he wanted to stay on, really, for uh, both my brother and I, our, our, our kind of education. He felt, at the time, uh, good education from the UK uh, would be better than in India, um, so he ended up staying here. Um, and I think it then came to a point where he realised he couldn't go back to India, um, he had stayed out of the country, even though we were going every year to see family, he stayed out of the country a little bit too much and adapted to his surroundings. And, uh, I, you know, even when my parents go back now for long extended uh, visits for maybe two, three months, uh, at the end of the two months, they've had enough. They can't cope with the heat, with the mosquitoes, with the with the service. You know, and Kerala is a very, very laid back um, state in India, it's it's a not uh, it, you know it's not a, a busy hustle bustle type of uh, place. And my mum, when she wants things done, she wants it done yesterday, um, and she can't cope with uh, the way the Indians do stuff. Amazing! I'd love to go Kerala one day. Uh, is the place in India I want to go to? I've been to Delhi, as you know. Uh, my wife is uh, uh, from Delhi, and uh, I, I hate the place. I'm sorry to offend anyone, but I, I hate going to Delhi. I like Mumbai, but Kerala is definitely on the map for me. What a beautiful country! Well, what a beautiful state! Even uh, I'd love to go Kerala one day. Um, interesting, you mentioned about your father not um, speaking uh, or not knowing English. My, my father, when we came in the 90s from Afghanistan, uh, my father, he still doesn't read or write English, actually. He's just about to get away because he, he, he owns a corner shop, you see. So um, it, it's interesting the sacrifices our, our parents make, you know, for the next generation, which is, uh, it, it really touched me, actually. So uh, amazing. Well, let's let's head to the, the main uh, part of this episode, which is the Back to Basics series we're doing. And it's about local anesthetic. Because as I was saying, like, we could, with you, George, we could have spoken about pterygoids. We could have spoken about uh, all sorts of advanced things you do. But I, th- I really do think, as, as, a, as a first episode, if you just get some foundations, some most common things that, uh, or the most foundation thing that we need to be able to be good at as a dentist is painless dentistry. And that's where local anesthetic comes in. But it's a daily struggle. Like We know lots of situations where we haven't been able to successfully numb a patient. It happens to me um, not too often nowadays, but still, um, it does uh, catch me up now and again, like it does all good dentists. So uh, let's start with a very basic question. Um, in my armamentarium, I pretty much use two or three things. 
It'll be R to K 90% of the time. It'll be lidocaine when I'm doing an ID block. Um, and even then, I'm doing less and less of those. Uh, and then sometimes when someone says that um, they, they can't have adrenaline, I'll have a adrenaline B alternative. So that's it. Now, this is, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, George, but I believe that this is the state of GDPs generally. Are we missing a trick or do we, is that all we genuinely need to get 100% success in anesthesia? It's a really difficult question, isn't it? Um, I wouldn't say it's the only thing you need, uh, but I, I would say 99.9999%. Uh, that's the early, early stuff you need. You don't need anything more. And it's the 99.9999% of uh, material I use as well, um, articane, lignocaine. I, I, of course, have uh, cytonist and you know all the other types of local with adrenaline-free but I hardly use it. Uh, and often it's a case of educating the patient. You know, I do big procedures, really big procedures, and patients coming in saying they can't have uh, adrenaline in their local anesthetic, it's really going to compromise like massively. It will compromise the, the work that I, I can perform and do. Um, and it's a, it's a case of re-educating uh, the patient and explaining you're not allergic to adrenaline. You've got adrenaline in the body. You can't be allergic to it. Uh, you may be sensitive to it, but often that may be the, the previous dentist uh, who may have given an injection or infiltration or, or, or a block, um, and they uh, put some of that local into uh, a vascular um, you know, region, and they felt the palpitation um, mixed with anxiety. It may have set off a bad reaction. It's very rare to have a patient who is truly allergic to uh, anesthetics. Of course, there are patients who are allergic to anesthetics. Often that may be the ingredients, the other ingredients, the preservatives within the anesthetic. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not really going to be the adrenaline. Um, and if those patients are truly allergic, you would know even before you see them. Um, because they'd know the full history and they would have got tested in hospital and, and all kinds because they would struggle with, with routine dentistry, let alone some of the more advanced or complex stuff that you may have to do, like extractions or uh, root canals and, and, and things like that. So yeah, generally I use articane and uh, lignocaine. Now, if you imagine the stuff that we do, we generally do full, full mouth stuff. Um, we're going into... Um, uh, into a much bigger type of surgery than your average general dentistry uh, that you would expect in primary care. And all we use is lignocaine and uh, articane. I do use the odd time bupivacaine, and that's more of a longer lasting uh, type of anesthetic. It can last for four to eight hours, so really quite long. Um, the onset takes a long time as well. But most people who use bupivacaine use it as a pain relief. So maybe after um, removal of all four wisdom teeth um, or we've done zygomatic implants and we're putting it um, as a post-op pain relief. So the patients have uh, a certain level of pain relief for when they get home and for a long period after that. Um, so yeah, other than that, other than removal of all four wisdom teeth or a, a very deeply impacted wisdom tooth, uh, or maybe zygomatics, the odd time, I don't use bupivacaine. So it's just um, articane and lignocaine. Good, because I, I, I really didn't know what you would say to this. I, you know, maybe you'd give like a recipe of seven different eight things that you, you'd be using. But I'm, I'm actually pleased to hear that you're achieving great results with the, the, the stuff that we all have in our drawers. So that's amazing. Now, uh, this question I didn't actually tell you in advance, but just came to my mind. The whole thing about avoiding articane for ID blocks. Now, some countries, that's not a thing. In this country, it seems to be a thing. Um, George, is it a thing? Uh, I, I, to be honest, I don't think so. But um, And although I don't disagree with using articane in, uh, for blocks, and it doesn't have to be ID blocks, it could be blocks in other parts of the mouth, um, I don't believe articane is, is an issue. I think the issue is normally down to trauma. Um, of the nerve because you see the same kind of complications with lignocaine um, or it could be certain preservatives. Now, some, some countries who also have articane like Germany or other parts of Europe, their articane um, makeup, uh, as in the other ingredients or preservatives, are slightly different. But in reality, I think the, the real issue and the issue we're talking about is uh, more nerve damage or nerve-related issues, especially associated with ID blocks. I don't think that's, an, uh, that's due to articane. I think that's due to trauma and the technique and so on. However, in saying that, 
I still use lignocaine for my ID blocks. And the only reason to use lignocaine is because I know if anything goes wrong in the case and it goes in front of a medical or a dental expert, I'm sure there will be one dental expert witness out there um, who will, on the side of prosecution, uh, put that forward as a, a problem. But no other reason. So it's purely down to medico legal reasons. It's true. And actually, um, I'd, I'd love for you to, to, to share what you were telling me before we actually started recording about we, we were talking about the kind of things you do. And you surprised me and said, yeah, you're still a bit of general dentistry as well. And uh, whereas I thought you'd limited to the you know, pterygoids and stuff. And then you said uh, I was talking about the fact that I now in a situation where I work in Reading, I'm trying to consolidate everything here, not having to commute so much. And, and you said, actually, you don't have that luxury because you're traveling around the country, uh, mentoring people in implants and advanced techniques. Uh, but we need that. We know we still need that. Um, someone there to help us hold our hands when we're doing these advanced techniques. Uh, and, and then you said something really interesting about how there's been a, a shift in t- the kinds of um, experience that young dentists are getting. Can you just elaborate on that? I really enjoyed that. Yeah, I think um, obviously I, I used to teach as an undergrad um, lecturer. I don't do that anymore. I still teach as a postgrad lecturer. Um, so I, uh, I will teach half a day at Liverpool Uni, teaching the postgrad, the specialist trainees. With the undergrads, and I'd also say the postgrads, the the the, the guy, the, you know, the guys and girls coming through, uh, they may not have experienced the same amount of clinical work and complications as we would have done. 20 years ago or even 15 years or 10 years ago. Uh, so that means, you know, the number of cases they do, not just at university, but also at VT and not just at VT, but also at, you know, DCT one, two, three. Um, I, I'm not sure if, if the newer generation are, are seeing the same number of clinical cases as we would have on a day. And even if they were to, um, I see a lot of medics and dentists. So it's not just limited to to dentistry, but medics and dentists, a surgeon, medical surgeons and dental surgeons, um, limiting the type of work they do because they're practicing defensively, which is a real shame. So with the increase in medico legal or dental legal uh, complaints and uh, the lawyers out there, uh, there's a lot of us practicing defensively. I mean, a few minutes ago, I just said, I don't use articane for an ID block, even though I believe it's fine, um, because of the medico legal uh, consequences. Uh, I mean, it, it's a real shame. So we're all practicing defensively. However, you know, in my generation, 10, 15 years ago, we could uh, practice and get mentored in complex work, uh, knowing that if there were any complications, the patient would be often very reasonable, accept the risks of the surgery, uh, even, you know, because they were told in advance and knew that, you know, it's failed and we can either try and fix it or, you know, that's it. And while these days, um, it's really quite difficult. I mean, we've got consent, which, you know, even though we consent the patients for whatever in the world, even the work that I do, a lawyer will always be able to find a hole in, in that consent paperwork. And, you know, there will be dental expert witnesses who will always be able to find a hole in our clinical notes. It's really quite tough uh, for the new generation. And I really feel for them. I, I don't know what the solution is for them, which is why I also try and mentor as much as possible, because it's quite difficult to, to learn advanced and complex work uh, without some sort of mentoring pathway. I think that is a solution, George. I think it is finding, if you're the young dentist who is uh, feeling like you have a, a lack of clinical exposure or you are practicing defensively the only way out is through mentorship I think and I think it's great that you do that and I think it's, um, it's great for the dentist who put their hands up and say yes I do need mentorship for this like we all know that comfort zones are, are a nice place to be but nothing ever grows in them so as even as a dentist I'm always looking at that next opportunity to uh, go just slightly now before maybe you make but when you know in, in your colleagues there uh, when you were learning you could have taken giant leaps out of your comfort zone I do feel now we're taking baby steps, but yeah, but you know, but it's, it's still good to take those baby steps out of your comfort zone. Yesterday, I did my first ever in practice by myself. I did my first ever, um, and the patient knew it was my first ever, and we had you know had this conversation beforehand and stuff. Um, palatal functional crown length in the case, so I raised a massive um, for me massive flat uh, upper three to three. Okay, and my mentor for that was uh, Amit Patel, who you, who you know very well. Which Amit Patel? Because there's a couple of Amit Patel. Pa- the perio chip guy. Pa- the periodontist in Birmingham. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, okay. 
<laughs> so he meant to do for that crown length thing case, did he? He he did, but the way we did it nowadays, uh, you know, we 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 I sat down with the photos and he described the protocol to me. He drew it for me. Uh, he sent me a photo on WhatsApp saying this is what I do. Then I sent him back to my thoughts. Then we exchanged some voice messages. And then he sent me some YouTube links to watch from the University of Michigan. So it was a great like um, remote uh, mentorship of that. But I have enough surgical background that I was able to 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 know. I didn't need hand holding on the day. I was able to crack on with it. But I've taken some photos. And I'm now going to send it back to him, and he's going to give me some feedback. So we have that thing going on but again it's a whole thing about taking small baby steps for, for, for me uh, and it's taken me eight years to get to this point where I think okay now I can do this kind of stuff you see so um, this is the kind of stuff that we need we need more mentorship and you got to identify any um, any way you can to, to get that so I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned that about you know the whole defensive dentistry because it's true it happens all the time now we are talking about exactly ID blocks and it's interesting how you also practice defensively like I do because I also believe that in other countries they use arcane on blocks and it's not an issue so I do tend to stick to lidocaine for my ID blocks, just like you, for the same reason. Any um, tips you can give on success for ID blocks? Um, interesting story. When I was in Vietnam on my elective, right? I thought you were going to say in the army when I was in Vietnam for what, during the war or something. <laughs> That's how that story started. I didn't know you practiced you, you in Vietnam. Back, back in Nam. Back yeah, in Nam. No, no, yeah. no, I went... <laughs> Back in Nam, on my elective, uh, there was this group of dentists who were, who were from Canada who were celebrating 25 years out of dental school, uh, and they were do, all doing this uh, big charity project. So we went, went to this like rural village in uh, near Da Nang, an hour away, and we went to the school and we set up a, a base there. We did all their restorations, fissure sealants, a lot. It was a great experience as a student to to see these um, experienced dentists uh, teaching us. Uh, and and one thing is, before these children had any sort of uh, restorations done, they'd be um, in one queue, they'd be given. ID block, so you'd go around giving ID block to him, okay? Then they'd go to the next queue and they'd be given a second ID block, George, from the same place because the rationale of the lead dentist, yeah, these kids, he was like, you know, nine, ten years old, okay? Uh, and the rationale, uh, this was maybe. 12 years ago, right, George? Or maybe maybe less, maybe 10 years ago. So the rationale there, George, was, and this is what he said, really lovely guy, great dentist, but this is what he said to me. He said, 50% of all ID blocks fail, so let's give these kids two ID blocks, so by the time they come to, <laughs> by the time they come to have their restoration, because what they didn't want is that the language barrier, right? They didn't want these little kids to be suffering and the language barrier and not be able to communicate. So what they did, they just gave them two ID blocks and then they sat down, they had their dental work. It was like a whole factory operation. Just a cool story that I'd tell you in terms of uh, an interesting experience I had, but that just highlights highlights the fact that in general dentistry, you know, ID blocks, they can be a little bit hit and miss. So where are we going wrong? Any tips that you can give us for success? Yeah. So in reality, the only time it goes wrong is it's not because of, of it being an ID block. It's because of the technique, isn't it? Often it's a mixture of the technique uh, and the anatomy. Um, and I, I don't actually see anything wrong with giving two ID blocks. Um, but on kids, you know, it's quite it's quite difficult to give an ID block on a nine year old anyway. You know, I've got a nine year old son, I've got a five year old son, I've got a twelve year old daughter, no, eleven year old uh, sorry daughter, and to give ID blocks on that kind of age group that's difficult, especially if you can't communicate. Although I'm sure the uh, the Vietnamese kids were rock hard, they just had to get on with it, and you know, if their parents were there, they'd probably get a slap if they um, if they messed about with the with the dentist helping them. Because I know I did in India, we were. So we were, here. you know, it was it was quite a harsh punishment if we didn't sit still. Um, but yeah, it's technique, isn't it? And I do see a lot of colleagues, and not just dentists. I'm talking about therapists as well, uh, maybe hygienists. They'll shy away from the ID blocks because they feel, oh, you know what? It's not a it's not a reliable technique. Um, so I'll, I'll move on to other techniques like intraligamentaries uh, for dentists. It could be other techniques like intraosseous. Um, although I'm not, I don't think intraosseous is as commonly used but it's a very it's an excellent technique um but colleagues shy away from id blocks um because they they you know they feel they're not very good at it and unless you're doing more and more you won't really understand the anatomy or the feel or where that needle needs to go i see sometimes colleagues often freshly and um not just recent qualified, but, you know, people who have been 10 years plus, they don't actually know where that needle end, the, the tip, is meant to go. So if you don't know where the needle tip is meant to go, you can't visualize where you're meant to be going with the ID block. And if you can't visualize where you're meant to go mm -hmm. with the ID block, it's always going to be hit and miss because you just don't know what you're trying to achieve. So I would always say, you know, if you want good success with the ID blocks, you need to look and study the anatomy. You know, even if it's on a skull, and then relate that to your patient, you know, to a living patient. 
Uh, George, on on that note, because one, you know, I know you're going you're you're to give us a guideline for success. Of course, learn the anatomy. But um, two two things to reflect on what you said there uh, on on the patient in front of you, because I had this thing in the beginning where if if, if someone was overweight versus someone was super skinny, that anatomy difference how it presents to you can can really throw you off when you're learning the technique. Uh, and and er, I think every dentist maybe has this, George. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you, you sometimes go through a bad patch of your ID blocks not working. I certainly had it a few times in my career, in my you know eight years so far, where I just went through a bad patch where for some time, my f four ID blocks in a row were just not successful. I was giving three of them to, to get it to work at that point. Obviously, it's definitely technique at the, at the time and, and a lack of skill, lack of expertise. But uh, I've heard this from a few dentists speaking to them. That actually, they've just got, we've been through a bad patch sometimes. And obviously, it's the same mistake that you're making over and over again. So, so when that happens, it's, it's important what you do next. If you've got an issue, um, you, would, you should ideally then reflect on, on what the issue is and how can you improve it. So look at your anatomy books, look at the skull, look at techniques. Even, you know, in this day and age, we've got YouTube and a whole bunch of things showing correct techniques of ID blocks. That's what you should do. Sometimes colleagues um, will think, oh, you know what, this isn't working for me. I'll move on to another technique or keep trying uh, three times or four times uh, instead of looking at where they're going wrong. Uh, and it's really having that thought process of where am I going wrong? How can I improve as opposed to uh, not actually finding out what the problem is? Um, and that, that's the most important message here. You know, everyone um, will have failures, everyone. Um, but then if you have a failure, what do you do? Are you the type that just doesn't, you know, reflect and, and try and learn from it? Or are you the type to learn from it, uh, improve and then move on? going forward um, so yeah it's always a technique thing as well as anatomy don't get me wrong um, you could have a perfect technique but then you're assuming uh, that the nerves are where they should be and they're not always where they should be um, so you know there could be a, a, a difference in anatomy um, the other aspect is on the patient I mean you just mentioned a skinny patient and a patient who could be a, a little bit more uh, larger in size and often if you've ever uh, encountered patients who are really quite uh, um, overweight, you know, they've got a, a large amount of fat in the cheek. You may not get into the area where you want or the mouth opening may be limited or, you know, for whatever reason. Or you may need to actually advance the needle all the way in to the, to the hub actually goes uh, just by, by the mucosa, which obviously we're taught not to do. And that is scary when you have to do that. But that, that's the only way you're going to get through that um, fat tissue. Yeah, unless you've got extra long needles, which, you know, they're standard needles. Um, but I mean, it, it, even with those kind of patients to get through the tissue, you know, the patients who can't open if they have trismus or whatever you know have you looked at gal gates have you looked at akinosi these are all variants of uh, achieving the same outcome as an id block they're just different techniques i'd probably say they're moderate to advanced techniques um, they're not your standard id blocks they're not as commonly performed but if you're doing more complex stuff or patients who are a little bit more trickier um, or differences in anatomy um, i would look towards those techniques as well i mean the standard thing i do is if i have a a block that's not work. My default thing that I was always taught is just go again, just maybe a centimeter higher. And that's my default. Um, is, is that an accepted practice? I think that is. I think um, if you go, uh, you know, a little bit higher, sometimes it depends on where you are, right? I mean, if you go, uh, if you're already high and you're going higher, well, that's not going to work. Um, but if, if it, it really depends on where you started off. So you could say you could go higher, you could go more uh, further back in the mouth, you could go, uh, you know, more uh, outside, you know, a bit more closer towards you or a bit lower down. Um, but then you won't know if you need to go higher or lower or wherever you need to go if you don't have a basis of where the correct anatomy should be in the first place, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, it does. So I, I guess the main message here is uh, if you're going through that bad patch that I described, really hit the anatomy books again related to your patient. Uh, go back and watch those videos, like you said, then they're, all, they're widely available. I'll link a few uh, in, in the blog post below uh, for those who to click on to. There's some good ones that we, we can we can share for sure. Um, hitting bone, yay or nay? I don't routinely do it. I, I was taught that, but that was a long time. Nor, nor do I, by the way, but um, I just want to hear your, uh, what, why you think uh, what you do what you do. So you don't hit bone because... Because theoretically, whether it's true or not, but theoretically, uh, there's a small deformity to the tip of the needle. And as you withdraw it back out, you can get more trauma. Uh, and, you know, especially on a patient who may be, you know, on certain blood thinners or whatever it is, um, that can cause more of an impact. So I, I don't tend to do it. And, and to be honest, I've not done it for a long time. My ID blocks are 
pretty successful. Um, so if I needed to do it, I would be doing it, but I've not needed to do it. Yeah, um, exact same reason. So I used to do it. In fact, when I was a new grad, uh, it was like, I love the feeling of hitting bone because I know I'm there kind of thing. You know, it's a hit bone, hit bone, because that's what we were taught, right? Uh, and then I stopped doing it because I'd seen a few slides. I think it might have been a... a um, Radislaw is that Polish uh, implant uh, guy? What's his name? Yeah, Radislaw. Yeah, uh, I, d- I can't. I, I know who you're talking. About. I, I know who you're talking about. I think a lot of people know he's, he's quite well known in Europe for for, 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 uh, for implant dentistry. Uh, and I believe he shared a, a slide and showing this to, and used like gloves or something where when you have a needle versus when you've hit bone and it does damage that uh, needle a bit uh, and then that can cause more trauma. So that's yeah, same reason for, as you is why I don't hit bone anymore. So that's um, some food for thought there. I mean, that's not to say um, I do uh, use the tip of the needle to hip bone and other techniques, so other more advanced Mm -hmm. local anaesthetic techniques. Um, So something my dad taught me was a a thing in plastic surgery called hydrodissection, where they use uh, some sort of fluid uh, to separate tissue. Um, and I tend to do that for, not for blocks, uh, but for infiltrations, especially if I'm raising a flap, I will um, ensure that the needle has hit the bone. Um, because at that point, I know that the tip of the needle is under the periosteum. And then as I uh, mm. inject, uh, it will lift the periosteum off the bone. So even before I start cutting, I know that that periosteum is going to fall off the bone. That is genius. Yeah, so it makes my flap raising uh, extremely uh, simple. So anyone who's done my courses or who I've mentored uh, will often use that technique. Uh, It makes the local anesthetic more effective as well because obviously the local anesthetic is close to bone. Something like articaine needs to diffuse through the bone. So I know it's not going to just be in the soft tissue well away from where I'm going to work as well. So it depends on what I'm doing. So I will use the needle tip and hit the bone for those kind of uh, techniques, but certainly not for ID blocks. And it's not just ID blocks. Obviously, we've got infraorbital block and other um, other blocks, you know, mental nerves and, and things like that. I would never uh, advance the needle to try and hit the bone uh, around the nerve because I know it could potentially cause trauma. Brilliant. I'm, I'm so glad you shared that. Uh, amazing. Now, we were talking earlier now, obviously, in the theme of back to basics. Let's talk about a really common scenario, the hot pulp, uh, the lower molar that's uh, in severe pain uh, and it's difficult to numb. And I've been in that scenario where you try everything. You first try the ID block, then maybe you give a second ID block, then you give an articane infiltration buckley, then you do a bit of soft per- periosteal, then you put some in the attached gingiva, then you go a little bit lingual, right? And you've like um, injected in every single site possible, yet the patient is still not numb, right? So um, you were telling me an interesting story about a patient in Reading. Just, just share that with everyone, please, if you don't mind. You know, I, I completely forgot. You're, you're based in Reading. I should have sent him to to see you to have a go before he came to see me. So uh, this patient had a hot pulp, lower six, your classic um, uh, hot pulp, lower six, but it could also be upper molars as well. It kind of, uh, you know, it, it's the same learning out- outcomes or, or, or points um, that we can we can learn from. So a patient who had uh, a hot pulp on the low left six, um, he had seen his dentist uh, to attempt extirpation. Uh, dentist couldn't get anywhere near this tooth. They had uh, tried uh, double ID blocks, infiltrations all the way around, you know, as you said, lingual and intraligamentary and all kinds still couldn't touch the tooth. You know, even the gentlest touch of the drill um, sent him off uh, in, in pain. Um, he saw another uh, GDP in the same practice uh, who had a bit more of an endo interest. Again, same scenario, multiple ID blocks, multiple local, couldn't touch it. Uh, they gave him antibiotics, uh, anti-inflammatories, um, you know, for a number of uh, days. I think it was for a week to try and see if it settled down. Attempted again, still no joy. So this is his third attempt. Um, they then referred him out to an uh, endodontic specialist, Um, uh, And again, he went there. The endodontist attempted, still no joy. Uh, So his mum, who was a patient of mine and I've treated uh, for advanced restorative work, uh, reached out to me because she lived in the, uh, I think she lived in North Wales, um, you know, explaining her son lives in Reading. He's had, I think it was coming up to three weeks of uh, no sleep. He couldn't work. He was. It was really affecting his quality of life. Now she knew I don't. <laughs> that I don't do root canal, especially uh, multi-rooted uh, teeth. 
I certainly don't do root canal, uh, but would I be willing to see him to try and help? And I said, fine. Um, and I spoke to the patient, you know, checked medically fit and well and all the rest of it. And he came up to see me uh, while I was working in a clinic in Manchester. Uh, again, same thing. Um, and, I, uh, and, you know, when a patient comes to see you, you start to get a little bit cocky. You know, I can manage this patient. This is fine. You know, I'll easily do it. Look at the work that I do. Anyway, patient came in. Um, <laughs> Double ID blocks, intraligamentaries, uh, mental nerve, you know, the full works, lingual, everything, uh, started to drill the tooth. It was going okay. I was getting, you know, I was getting much further than the previous uh, dentist. Um, and then I, I got to the pulp and, yeah, again, just couldn't cope with this extreme, extreme pain. Couldn't go anywhere near it. And unfortunately, you do come across these situations. It doesn't matter how much local you're using. Um, and I had already given an intraosseous as well. So I'd given him double ID blocks. Mm. I'd given him intraligamentary. I'd given an intraosseous, uh, which I don't often do, but I do do that in the odd occasion. Still nothing touched it. Um, and you do get these kind of cases. And, and sometimes I think colleagues think, well, you know, uh, these people can do it and it's magic. Actually, it's not. It's a case of then sitting the patient up and saying, look, this is not going to be comfortable. Whatever I do is not going to touch it. But if you give me a few seconds, I can sort this out for you. But you will be in discomfort for the one maximum two seconds. Are you okay with that? Now, this chap, he was an adult, you know, he, he, he's had pain for well over three weeks. And um, we'd already got further than, you know, at this point, I was already beyond the main pulp chamber. I was going to the different canals. Uh, he was more than happy to give it a go because he knew uh, I'm doing the main bulk of work here. And it literally is a case of putting that needle in the pulp chamber down those canals and for that one second maybe two seconds really you know pressing into that uh, canal with the local anesthetic it's not actually the local anesthetic uh, that just does the work it's also the pressure you know just ripping mm. that nerve apart and at that point it's fine and that's essentially what i did so uh, i got to the point of you know removing up to the pulp and that's when he, you know he could feel the pain uh, and that's all I did. It was an intrapulpal, you know, for that one or two seconds. Uh, and once that was done, he was fine. No pain. And I could continue to carry on with uh, full extirpation, put the calcium hydroxide down there, uh, temporize uh, and, and send him away. And, you know, he was in, he was so appreciative uh, over the following days that he, you know, gave a really nice uh, hamper because it was the first time he could get wow. sleep. Uh, for you know for three weeks and that's really you know if, if anyone's had toothache that's really quite debilitating i have had severe toothache my friend my lower incisors uh all four of them root failed two fractured so we think orthodontics cause um my uh, lower four incisors to uh, necrose so uh, first time present first year of uni severe throbbing ache i was in tears uh, first year uni at den school in sheffield uh, we go up randomly to take a pa and this is huge uh, apical pathology all around my lower incisors anyway so yes I've definitely been there the worst thing ever but you know what I was smiling throughout that story you were saying George because I was actually expecting you to say he came up to see me and we got him numb through one ID block and this is how I did it right uh, but I just love the human side that you showed there the real the the reality that you know what no matter what you do the hot pulp is a hot pulp okay and you you get you do the best you can and then it's about getting that intrapulpal so I'm actually really pleased uh, and I really appreciate the humility in, in sharing a not, not, not a failure in any way you know you, you got a hamper uh, you, you, you got to make someone out of pain but in an ideal world you would have loved to have even one ID block and uh, you know pulled up your collars and that yep done that but it's sometimes just not possible so it's, it's great that you share that because a lot of young dentists listening we're going to encounter this scenario every six months or something like that or maybe even more frequent if you're in an emergency setting or you know, whatever, depending on what kind of practice you're in but it's a scenario we must face and that communication gem you gave George is, is key that you just have to say to the patient look this is a situation Give me a little bit of time, we will get you out of pain, but it's not going to be a, a joyful ride for those 10, 20 seconds. In that scenario, a painless experience, unfortunately, is just not possible. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, you really do have to sit the patient up, give him the, you know, give them the options. Look, this will take literally one to two seconds. It will be uncomfortable, uh, but it will sort you out. Or I can just stop here. Uh, put some leather mix or whatever where I've uh, gone up to, temporize, 
you know, give it another week or, you know, and this patient had already been on a week's worth of ibuprofen in advance um, just to settle things down before my attempt as well. Um, but, you know, it works. You know, th there's no real magic technique. It's just a case of, look, this is what we need to do. This is the reality. We can either go down this path or this path and that's it. And, you know, I've had, I've had really bad toothache as well. So during COVID, um, I don't know if you know this, but during COVID, I had severe acute acute pulpitis from my lower left six. Oh. Um, and that was on Good Friday during COVID. Now I knew the I knew the guys in the Liverpool Dental School um, treating the COVID pulpitic uh, type, uh, you know, th that service, all they were, all they could offer was extraction at that point because of COVID. It was very early on. So dental treatment was very, very much limited to take teeth out. That's it. Um, and I didn't want to burden them. I know quite a few endodontists. I work with quite a few endodontists. I'm really, really slick operators. This was se this was 7 p.m. on Friday because I thought I'd just persevere with it. It just got worse and worse and worse. And by 7 p.m., I couldn't actually close my mouth. It was that bad. It was it was severely uh, affecting me. So I had to get my wife, uh, get the kids in the car, drive to my practice. I've got a practice as well. Uh, I put them in the waiting room. And then in front of a mirror, I had to give myself an ID block. I had to give myself uh, <laughs> intra <laughs> no, I had to give myself an intralic an ID block, not even like an infiltration. You you gave yourself an ID block. An ID block, uh, intraligamentary. Started to extirpate. It was a hot pulp. So as soon as I started getting into uh, near the pulp chamber, I experienced exactly what uh, this lad I treated experienced, which was acute pain. You know, as I was getting close. And again, I had to give myself a, a an intrapulpal. Um, and I've recorded this because I was using my phone as the mirror while I was treating myself. That's amazing. I know, yeah. And uh, as I gave the intrapulpal, I didn't realize the sound was uh, being recorded. But as I gave myself an intrapulpal, as I was reviewing back the videos, all I could hear was myself grunting, going, oh, <laughs> because it was that painful. <laughs> but I, had to keep my, I had to keep my mouth open while I'm numbing myself up through the pulp. But honestly, after that was done, it was like magic. I could, you know, I, I found all four canals extirpated done <laughs> you obturated with sips system b in obtura you did your own cram prep <laughs> no, no, no. i didn't obturate i i, I did put a, a decent enough uh, restoration over the tooth but honestly that night i had the best sleep that i'd had for about a week because this this constant like acute pulpitic pain that I was experienced. You know, it was coming in waves of pain. You know that classic textbook, uh, you'd experience waves of pain. That's what I was experiencing. And it was it was horrendous. I mean, I, I can't believe you gave yourself an ID block and you did all that and hats off to you. And I was thinking in my head, wait, how can you even bring yourself to do that? But you know what? I do remember the time when I had the severe pain. We've only just been taught um, as um, entering second year dental school at that point in Sheffield, we get early exposure to extractions and we'd only just been taught how to extract your teeth and you know what I, I, it crossed my mind you know that I had some pliers uh, so it, it's, yeah, dental pain as you experience is the worst thing ever as, as we know as we experience so um, it's great it's great you shared that story I'm actually amazed you did that that's really impressive uh, so final question George I think a, a lot of a lot of great gems a lot of varied gems we've covered to, today I think everyone will find this really useful but uh, just give us a flavour of you know I, I said to you earlier when we were planning this episode like you don't know what you don't know and I probably have no idea that these advanced techniques even exist but what kind of moderate and advanced techniques do you do to to use utilize to be able to do the kind of dentistry you do what do you teach uh, on your um, courses in terms of technique wise i suppose because of the, the the surgical techniques that i'm teaching or implant techniques that i'm teaching require really good adequate anesthesia like ultra good you know a lot of the times we're doing this just with local anesthetic alone we may have some midazolam mixed in there but you know sedation is not a substitute for uh, achieving local anesthesia if the patient is not numb and they're sedated it can actually bring them out of the sedation and make the procedure even worse because they're not comfortable so it's really really important to have really good you know adequate anesthesia achieved and a comfortable patient and these kind of techniques that we we tend to use will be for example uh, we 
we teach blocks to the uh, posterior superior alveolar nerve, blocks for the uh, middle uh, superior uh, alveolar nerve, the uh, blocks to anterior uh, superior alveolar nerve, the nasopalatine block or incisive nerve block, uh, greater palatine block, um, which is really quite important for things like crown lengthening on the palatal aspect to even just reduce bleeding. Um, or harvesting mm. connective tissues um, or lifting up large palatal flaps. You need to now to uh, you know, adequately uh, achieve anesthesia there. Uh, mental nerve blocks, of course, but also lingual uh, blocks. So these are the kind of range, but then also extra oral techniques. I think as dentists, we, we're commonly taught how to numb up the patient from the inside of the mouth and not from the outside of the mouth. So I tend to do a lot of uh, blocks from the outside. So if it's an infraorbital block that I need to achieve, um, I will do an extra oral infraorbital block. Um, if we're doing work on the zygomatic, we will do uh, extra oral blocks for the zygomatic region. Um, sometimes we do a full uh, maxillary block. So you can achieve a, a, a block for the whole uh, one side of the maxilla in one go. Um, and you can do that through two methods. You can go through the greater palatine foramen uh, and, and achieve uh, anesthesia uh, to the whole maxilla through that route, or you can go uh, extra orally um, into the uh, uh, past the pterygomaxillary fissure and deposit the local uh, through the extra oral approach. So these are quite, um, ad, you know, a, a bit more advanced complex techniques. Um, it's not just a case of you get your normal dental local uh, and start sticking uh, things wherever. You can do some real damage uh, doing uh, these types of techniques incorrectly, as you can, you know, as you can imagine. You know, for example, uh, if you're incorrectly taught or, or shown how to do an extra oral infraorbital block, um, you can cause blindness to the eye. Um, so you can really do some damage. Mm -hmm. uh, but these are the more advanced techniques that we would cover in our uh, courses. I mean, maybe I'm just showing my ignorance, but yeah, I just didn't appreciate the, um, the role of extra oral blocks. I've never seen one being done before. I have seen, um, and I'm on a course learning about it at the moment, um, extra oral um, TMJ sort of anesthesia and, and that kind of stuff. That's my kind of interest I'm developing. But I've never see, seen it for, um, maybe because maybe you see this on, on max max positions and I didn't hold one for long enough to, to see that kind of stuff. But yeah, you kind of forget sometimes in dentistry that there are extra oral blocks available and as well as all the others uh, that you said. So, so that's really fascinating. I can't believe I didn't ask you this, my friend, any tips on getting painless palatal um, injections. Now, what I do at the moment, here what I do at the moment, I just, put, I just push really hard with the handle of my mirror. Is there anything above and beyond that that I could be doing? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's probably the best way. I would also suggest not just pushing really hard, but making a little bit of vibration to it as well. Um, so it's not just pushing hard, but pushing and, and, and vibrating in a remote area uh, where you're mm. uh, providing the uh, local anesthetic. I would also, while at the same time, if you're going to do that, just deposit a few drops of anesthetic first. So you don't give the full cartridge, give a few drops, then come out, give it a minute or a minute and a half, and then you can go back and then slowly give the local. When, you know, when we're talking about techniques, I, I, you know, I've seen dentists where they're pressing really hard and giving the local, but it, it's everything, isn't it? It's not just pressing hard, it's also giving the local slowly. You know, I've seen people just pump that local. 100%. And often the pain is not uh, just the needle tip going in. It's the expansion of the tissues. And if you're expanding the tissues very quickly uh, and stretching it very quickly, it will cause pain. And why, you know, if you can avoid it, why would you, uh, why would you not look to avoid it? Um, so I would suggest um, pressing hard, vibrating on the handle of, uh, of your mirror, uh, remotely in a different area, uh, and then dropping a little bit of local anesthetic in the palate. You know, a, a, good, a good small amount, but enough to achieve uh, a decent amount of anesthesia, withdrawing, giving it a minute or so, then going back in uh, and, and, and slowly providing that local, you know, very, very slowly. The slower, the better, actually, depending on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a single tooth, you've got all the time in the world. The other alternative is you're giving your buccal articane first, then after the buccal articane, you can then go in palatally because often the buccal articane can uh, go through the bone onto the palatal side. But what I tend to do is I'll give the buccal articane first and then I'll uh, numb up the crest with articane. Um, and then once the crest is numbed up, you can then slowly go down the palate 
um, while moving the mirror and doing all the other stuff. I think in an ultra nervous patient, uh, that's how uh, you know, when you've got the luxury of as much time as you can. Yes, I would be doing it. I think that way as well. Buckle, then uh, um, papilla area, then the palatal papilla area, and then progress it. That's the, the uh, you know the way I've achieved the, the most painless palatal. That's that, that's the best way. And I do well with with all of that as well. Um, I, I think this has been a really valuable episode, George. But at least if you've got anything else to, to add, yeah, please. I was going to say if you if you're really looking at the the full process, if you've got a, a patient who's really nervous about numbing up. Um, and you know they're, they're still not really uh, suitable for, or you, or you can't provide station for whatever reason. Obviously, give the topical on the cotton wool roll on the buckle aspect. Uh, once the topical's been there for you know a good three, four, five minutes, then take it out and you insert the needle by only one to two millimeters only within uh, the mucosa, not the gingivae, not the, the fixed gingivae, but high up in the mucosa, give, you know, uh, again, like the palate, give a small amount of local, wait for that to, to, to kick in. Then you can go back, give it a little bit more local, again with articane, uh, uh, wait for that local to kick in. This is all in the mucosa. Once that's kicked in, you should be able to anesthetize the, the papilla and the, the attached uh, gingivae. Uh, once that's kicked in, you can then go to the papilla on the lingual or palatal aspect, um, wait for that to kick in, and then on the palate. So, you know, th th there is a, a progressive route. Now, in saying that, I would often do that in single teeth uh, type work or maybe multiple teeth type work. You know, when you're doing... Uh, things like zygomatics and full arch and you know a whole bunch of more complex stuff often the patient may be sedated but generally you don't have that time uh, because the local anesthetic has a certain period of time that it's effective for so once the local's in you know you, you, you're really starting a, a you know a bit of a countdown that that brings me on to another uh, subject as well often colleagues will put the local in give it a few minutes and then crack on with the work um, and that's not how, how things should be done. You know, you put your local in, whether it's an ID block or infiltration, that local anesthetic takes a, a specific time uh, for it to diffuse into the tissues adequately. And often, more often than not, dentists will start uh, doing the work, doing the treatment before that's fully kicked in. And ideally, what you should do is you give your local, uh, check the time. Uh, so for example, you know, the time's 3.30, uh, you finish your local. I would then, uh, on my clock, even for big mouth, even for zygomatics, more so for zygomatics, uh, but I would start a, a timer. I want 10 minutes to have passed before I start treating the patient, before I start cutting the patient, before I start drilling the patient. You've got to have adequate time for that anesthesia to be, uh, you know, to be effective because if, if you've not given adequate time it could still be in the soft tissues it may not have diffused into the bone into the nerves or wherever you're going to you know you're going to work um, so that's a really important aspect of um, trying to provide successful local anesthetic that's a, a great point and often something that um, the easiest thing to skimp on is the time like if you're in a rush you or you're, you're trying to you know be you know the time is the easiest thing to just sort of skip on and yeah a couple of minutes later you're started but whenever i do have a, a a particularly nervous patient or someone with a history of being difficult to numb for whatever reason they're the kind of patient i'll be booking in just for anesthesia and then see a checkup while they're waiting outside uh, because they need that time because not often the technique is just about giving them enough time as well and you, you, you're so right with that um george please tell us uh, for, for you know for your, you do lots of implant courses and stuff a lot of the, the, the audience that listen and watch this are at various various levels uh, of their career um what kind of a, a dentist the kind of dentist who, who's gonna be learning uh, implants from you and what kind of stuff uh, do you have available for them what kind of resources courses do you run I'm not sure where to start. Um, so I, I suppose most people know me for courses um, on more complex advanced techniques. So generally, uh, my courses uh, involve learning uh, zygomatic implants, and I've got a great... Uh, so for every course, I have a great co-instructor. So for zygomatics, I have someone called Guy McClellan, uh, who teaches uh, the zygomatics on that course. I teach the pterygoids. We both will teach the transsinus. So that's one course. But it's not just implant courses. Um, we teach uh, bone grafting, so big bone grafts. Uh, we teach gum uh, soft tissue grafting, and you mentioned Amit Patel. Uh, Amit Patel runs a, a, a course uh, with me, uh, and we teach on cadavers um, because we feel pig's heads aren't really um, appropriate to learn. 
uh, true techniques. You know, a pig's soft tissue or bone or anatomy bears no resemblance or similarity to a human. So why learn from uh, a pig when we have, you know, really good quality cadavers about these days? So Amit Patel uh, heads up the soft tissue grafting course. We have Sanjeev Banderi who uh, heads up the apical microsurgical course. And again, that's on cadavers. Um, we have Sammy Stagnall. Uh, we're talking about local anaesthetic. So Sammy Stagnall is a consultant oral surgeon. Uh, he heads up um, the local anaesthetic course. Uh, and again, that course is uh, on cadavers. Uh, and we will be teaching more ad advanced intraoral techniques. So whether that's gal gates or akinosi or just normal good quality ID block techniques or mental nerve block techniques or good quality infiltration techniques. Uh, and then if, uh, if there are some advanced uh, practitioners out there, we will teach extra oral uh, techniques to those um, colleagues. Uh, and then, of course, I teach full arch implants, um, and that's a hands-on course. So all of these courses are hands-on. They're not theory. Um, again, I teach a hands-on course for full arch implants. Um, and the, so that's not just for fixed bridges. We have a new course coming out in next year. That's with someone called Harpal Chana, uh, who's a, a restorative consultant based in London. Uh, and that will be, again, another hands-on uh, implant overdenture course. So there's a, there's a number of courses that I run, quite a few. Uh, I think next year there's something like 24 courses, uh, all hands-on. Wow, busy yeah. year. Busy year, yeah. Um, all hands on, all with various specialists in their field uh, teaching that subject. Um, but yeah, so yeah, it's, it gets well, quite busy. Well, if you busy. can just leave me your, if you can uh, email me the, the website, because you know, every episode I like to share what the presenters have, uh, because uh, a lot of time people resonate with what you said, uh, and they'll usually uh, message me on Instagram saying, uh, how do I get hold of, who, who, what's the email address for this person? How do I get on uh, to learn more from this uh, speaker? So I know that what you spoke about today will, it's such a fundamental topic, right? LA, and then those who may need help with grafting, or whatever, may be looking for a course like yours. So if you send me the website, I'll put it on the protrusive website um, uh, for for those to see how they can uh, learn from you, George. So I really appreciate that if you do that. Yeah, I'll definitely do that. I mean, most people, I think, find me on Facebook as Implant Dude, but that uh, friendship number has it has kind of maxed out. So I, I, I'm a bit behind the times. I've just kind of started <laughs> Instagram. I'm a bit rubbish at Instagram, but again, <laughs> I, you know, I'm trying. I'm on there as Implant Dude, but the courses are under uh, the, uh, the website uh, Advanced Implant Training. Um, but I'll put it up. I'll, I'll, I'll send you a text uh, where you yeah, can. Yeah, if you share it with me, now, and I'll stick it on protrusive.co.uk for everyone to see. Uh, Protrusive Rati, thank you so much for joining me and George today. I uh, hope you found that as useful as I did. Uh, George, thanks so much for your time. Uh, that was really awesome. I think lots of, from communication gems to patient management to uh, a cool few stories in that, which I enjoyed. Uh, thanks so much for giving up your time today. That's great. It was thank you so much for having me on, Jazz. There we have it, guys. I hope you enjoyed that episode with George. Lots of stories exchanged there. Uh, lots of bigger themes. You always like to focus on the big bigger picture on these episodes. Hope you found value from that. Hope you'll find that the next time you're going through a bad patch uh, of getting uh, ID blocks or the next time you're struggling to anesthetize someone's uh, molar, which is a hot pulp, you'll just relax and just explain to the patient what the scenario is, what's going on, and you won't always be successful. Hot pulps are one of those things you will not always be successful, so don't beat yourself up over it. If you can subscribe on the YouTube, I'd really appreciate that, and I'll catch you in the next episode. Back to Basics is going to be a huge one. It's all about extractions. You absolutely cannot miss the next episode. It is going to be probably the most profound episode I've ever done. So I'll catch you in the next one with Chris Waith.